Okay, we are live. Can you see me? Hi, Aya. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, maybe I can move this around. I kind of wanted to get my my picture of three sisters that I'm working on in there, but it's really our 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 talk is actually about three other sisters. And do you know which sisters I'm talking about? I know they're the Bronte sisters, correct? Yes. And actually, the Bronte family had six children at the very beginning. Um, and they were Maria, mm -hmm. Elizabeth, uh, and then Charlotte, and Patrick Branwell, the only boy. Wow. <laughs> and then Emily. And then the very youngest was Anne. So mm -hmm. the reason we, we always just talk about the three sisters is two of the elder sisters died in childhood. Oh, wow. And Branwell, who was very, um, very talented, uh, was actually a painter as well as a writer. Um, unfortunately, he had an addiction problem. He drank and he used some other kind of drug. I can't remember, opium or... Yeah, something along those lines, I'm sure. Yeah. So he, he died young and did not live up to his potential, which leaves us with only three sisters who actually ended up writing novels, getting them published, and they are, of course... Charlotte, Emily, and Anne by age, you know. So which of the Bronte sisters do you know the most about? I want to be really honest with you. I've watched Wuthering Heights. I've watched Jane Eyre. I've heard things about the Bronte sisters in passing, but I have never looked them up. So I don't really have a strong knowledge about their family or any That's of the okay. sisters. Yeah. That's Just, okay. I mean, there were times when uh, you were the person who had read up, like on Colleen McCulloch, I admitted I, I had not read her. I did see the series, you know, the Thornbirds, but I had not read her. It's okay. It's, you know, this is one where I happen to kind of be a fan. And I like that. Like, I, I value that. Like, I actually have always wanted to read more of the Brontes. It's just something I never got around to. And I actually think that's okay because sometimes later in life, you discover a book and you're like, wow, I haven't read that. But maybe I can appreciate it more now than I could 20 years ago or something. I don't know. Like, if right. I were to read it, I think I really could appreciate it. So it is something that I kind of want to put on my to-do list after I watch Mr. Sunshine. Okay, very good. And Mr. Sunshine is a wonderful show coming from Korea. Mm -hmm. We're going to have continued discussions on that. Mm -hmm. uh, not on this channel, but oh, the, yeah, because this but is on another one. Yeah, but I just wanted to throw out there. It seems like a they seem like what really strong women that had very interesting narratives. So I'll let you take the floor on that. Okay, well, I'll tell you how I got into the Brontes. So it was, the year was 1976. I was 15 going mm -hmm. on 16. And I was spending the night at my grandmother's apartment in Tel Aviv, Israel. Wow. Um, and she let me sleep in my grandfather's room. Now he had already passed away. And what you may not know is literary people often you know, even though they're happily married, they don't sleep in the same room. So he had his own room mm -hmm. and she had her own room. And in his room, you know, he was the rector of the University of Tel Aviv. And he was a very literary man. He translated Greek into Hebrew. He translated Persian classics into Hebrew. So he was wow. a very good man. But he was also aware of what was considered lesser literature. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like he had a he knew a little bit about everything, it sounds like to me. Right. So before I went to bed that evening, I felt like reading something and I I looked on the bookshelf and <laughs> I found this book. Let me see if I can get it up close so you can see it. Oh wow. Very neat. Weathering Heights. Yes, yes. 
<laughs> yes. And what uh, can you see what the publisher is? It says Pocket Books Incorporated. Is that what I'm seeing? Yes. So it's got a picture of a penguin. Uh, not a penguin. I'm like a kangaroo, I think. Is it a, a kangaroo? Yeah. yeah. Right. A kangaroo. I don't know why I but said penguin. That's no, it's not. fine. Yeah. And my grandfather's library, uh, he, he insured his books. And so he had to keep a list of all the books he had. Wow. So in his library... This was book number 512. Oh, wow. See, that's pretty neat. But my my grandmother then did a, some kind of, a, she, she went over it again after he died. And she had it as book 721. So I don't oh. know. <laughs> There's some additions, yeah. No, no. I mean, this is. Oh, she just redid the numbering system for some reason. Yes, she kept a card catalog of all the books in his library. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, uh, shall I read you what it says on the back? Sure, I would like to hear that. So it says, the strangest love story. Sounds very <laughs> <laughs> like purple <laughs> fiction, right? Uh, Emily Bronte was primarily a poet. Matthew Arnold said of her, for passion, vehemence, and grief, she had no equal since Byron. Yet her lasting fame is built on her first and only novel, Withering Heights, written but a year before her death at 29. Wow. Withering Heights is a powerful story in the tradition of Dracula and Frankenstein. <laughs> And that again they <laughs> does not sing quite right, but okay. Not quite, yeah. Um there there's really not anything truly supernatural in the story. No, or, I think what they're trying to say is gothic. Is that what they're trying? I don't know. Yes, they're trying to say gothic, but you know what? Emily wrote very beautiful naturalistic stories. And it was actually um Charlotte with Jane Eyre, who wrote Gothic. Okay, so they're getting the yeah. two confused, maybe. Interesting. Yeah, anyways, they're trying to sell books, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter if they read the book before yeah, writing. See, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> its background is the rugged moorlands of the north of England, and her characters are strange mixtures of savagery and gentleness. <laughs> It has been well described as the strangest love story ever told. And then, you know, because they want to, um, you know, I'll tell you when this came out to this particular edition. So you'll know what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Okay. First printing, May 1939. Hmm. 28th printing, December 1947. Oh. Okay. Okay. So uh, the first printing was, I, I think, before World War II broke out. And yeah. the last one listed here, 28th printing, was two years after World War II ended. Huh. Um, anyway, they're trying to sell books. So they say the unforget unforgettable motion picture star starring Merle Oberon, Laurence Olivier, and David Niven was universally acclaimed by press and public and will live forever. Well, I don't know whether it's going to live forever. Uh, they might get canceled for something. They might. Actually, that's something they used to say, though, in movie you know, trailers. Like, it will live in your memory forever. That's a catchphrase and many of the you'll hear it quite often actually yeah so anyway I stayed up and I read this book and it and I was 15 going on 16 and it really made a big impression on me oh. and I don't think it's really about the it's not it's not this stuff that they're trying to sell it with mm -hmm. it's not the sensationalistic stuff Mm -hmm. This is really a very well-made story. Um, and one of the things about it is 
that she shifts from point of view to point of view to point of view. And the story is sort of sandwiched. You know, you have somebody who comes into the area and he wants to know about this landlord of his and who lives at Withering Heights. And uh, so he talks to this other person who was the housekeeper of this family and she tells a story, uh, you know, so he's telling a story about this woman telling him a story. And then within the story, there are all sorts of parts that are to told in the voices of many other characters. Wow. And so you get to know, you have a feel for their reality, um, their community. And you see how you can't really believe anybody about anything. You yeah, for have, sure. You have to take everything that any character says with a grain of salt and then ask yourself what really happened. So you have to do a little bit of investigation, but it sounds like she's a good enough writer. She shows all these points of view within a story. It's not clunky at all. It sounds very well written. Yeah, no, so she really influenced me. In fact, um, you know, every one of my books that I wrote um, is influenced by somebody. <laughs> and the biggest influence of Weathering Heights was in Vacuum County. Okay, I'm definitely going to have to read Weathering Heights. I've watched the movie many years ago, but now I'm like really curious. Yeah, you know, and she has, it's very dark, yes, but she has a sense of humor too. <laughs> um, and I, I hope this won't spoil it for you because it's oh, it's fine. I like to know I'm different. I like to know about a story. I get more appreciation out of it. But keep going. Okay, so so like one of my favorite scenes is there's this guy, you know, the the the, the tenant who's trying to find out about all this, and he's kind of a foppish kind of guy, and he comes from the city, and he doesn't understand the ways of the people in the story you know because they're they're rural people and he comes from the city and uh he's very soft and they're hard and so anyway um he goes to visit heathcliff and he's trying to be, you know he's trying to be friendly and whatever and heathcliff has a bunch of dogs mastiffs you know uh by the fire and so Heathcliff goes to get something. I don't remember what, what exactly happened. Anyway, uh, the guest, our narrator, just kind of starts making faces at the dogs and they all attack him. <laughs> oh gosh, that was probably not the thing to do. <laughs> right, like he doesn't understand how to respect anybody. He thinks he can make faces at a dog or he can, he he doesn't and, and then Heathcliff has to come back and, and get the dogs off him. You know? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, so this is why I really love Emily as a writer. And you might think, well, how did she do that in her first ever novel? Well, guess what? She'd been writing all her life. Yeah. Um and so that brings me to the story of, you know, how those little kids in that house um, lived. So their father, uh, Patrick uh, Brenty, um, came from Ireland and got this position. You know, he was he came from a lower kind of class, but he got educated and he got this position um, based on his education. Uh, to be the rector of a uh, Haworth Parsonage. Oh, interesting. Yes. And so he brought his family along. <laughs> and, you know, so many kids, so many little kids, you know, one after the other, and his wife, and, and they uh, settled down there. And one day, he went to the city and he got a bunch of toy soldiers. Uh, they were supposed to be a gift for the children. And the children were delighted with the toy soldiers and they immediately started making up stories um, using the toy soldiers as characters. Aww. And so, 
you know, they read the news in, in the newspapers because the eldest sister, whose name was Maria, and she was named after the mother, the mother died shortly after Anne was born. So now the eldest sister, Maria, was sort of like a mother figure, although also uh, the mother's uh, spinsterly sister came to live with them. Uh, Elizabeth Branwell. So now we have the father who is uh, the rector at the church. And we have this, el well, not elderly at first, but anyway, the spinster unmarried um, aunt living with them, helping to take care of the children. And, and then the eldest sister is precocious. And so she reads the newspaper to the younger kids. Um, well, anyway, I, I might be getting some of this out of, out of, uh, order because at, at one point, some of the girls were sent off to a boarding school. Oh, okay. And there was an illness that was going around and Maria got, got sick and got sent home and was, in the sick room that her mother died in and she died too. That's so unfortunate. Yeah. And but it's I'll, reality of life back then. People forget this. Yeah. Well, it's the reality of life really, maybe for all of us in some way, you know, right now people are acting as though illness never existed in the world before. But it did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, same thing happened to Elizabeth. They brought Elizabeth home. Mm. And at that point, the father got sufficiently worried that he brought back the other two girls who were there. So mm -hmm. that's why um, it didn't happen to Charlotte and Emily. But Elizabeth also died. Mm -hmm. but anyway, those of them who were left, I believe, were the ones who got the toy soldiers. And, um, and they started writing stories based on their imagination and their readings and the stories in the newspaper. Um, and they, they went into, they, they partnered up. So um, Charlotte and Branwell, um, the, uh, they were one pair. They wrote stories together. I believe those stories were called the Angria stories. They had a country, a uh, made-up country that was called Angria, but it's really <laughs> kind of like England. <laughs> um, and um, then Emily and Anne, the youngest, were to paired up together. They wrote stories in the Gondol saga. Um, so they got a lot, a lot of experience writing when they were little. And yes. so once they became old enough to write their adult novels it's not like this was the first thing they'd ever written no i think writers actually do practice have other novels that are this is very common but she just happens to be a very adept writer it sounds like through all her experience well it's because i think she's a poet she has this way to get at things very succinctly mm -hmm. um and yeah, she, she really was more of, of a poetic figure. Now, Charlotte, Charlotte less so. Charlotte, Charlotte was the one, actually, without Charlotte, they would never have gotten published. Charlotte um, wanted to have a life. You know, they were living apart from other people way out there in the moors, and um, they didn't have a social life. And, but Charlotte really longed for success and for love and just, she wanted to have a life. Yes. And so Emily said she didn't really want to publish and, and Charlotte kept spurring her on. She said, we need to do this. And they published their, uh, they set about writing a novel each and they published uh, I mean, they sent it to a publisher and they didn't let them know that they were women. So they called themselves the uh, Bell Brothers. Uh, you know, Charlotte was Kerr, Bell. I forget all the the different 
names they gave themselves. But anyway, they, under a pseudonym, uh, they submitted their works. And I believe Wuthering Heights was accepted before anything of Charlotte's was accepted. So um, here's the thing. Uh, Charlotte wrote more than Emily. Mm -hmm. And right here we have the complete novels of Charlotte and Emily. So we have Jane Eyre, which is by Charlotte. We have Wuthering Heights, which is by Emily. And then Shirley Villette and the Professor by Charlotte. Okay. So uh, a lot of Charlotte's works were uh, kind of focused on the one experience that she had um, not being at Haworth Parsonage, but going out into the world. So at one point, uh, they had a scheme, the three sisters, that they were going to start a school and they were going to make a living that way because they had gone out to be, um, they'd gone out to be governesses and they hated it. And yeah. they, thought, they thought it would be better to have their own business and to support themselves that way. That's so, entrepreneurial. Yeah. Um, so Aunt Branwell, Aunt Elizabeth, Branwell um, had some extra money and she agreed to send Charlotte and Emily uh, to Brussels uh, so that they could study and pick up more French. Because if you're going to have a school for young girls, you yes. have to teach French, right? Definitely. It's, yeah, you have to. It's, even to this day, studying French is a standard, right? With a classical education, I believe. Well, classical education is actually Greek Latin, and, yeah. and Latin. <laughs> yeah. And for my grandfather, Persian. Um, but yeah, it's not classical. It's uh, It was just considered if you were going to be middle class or above, you needed to know French. Okay. Um, More like a standard middle class education. I guess I'm just trying yeah. to figure out what type of. So I understand. Yeah. yeah. No. 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 Like, like uh, Branwell was studying. Um, he was trying to translate Horace. You know, so he was studying Latin and Greek and all that. But girls were not really expected to study that. They were expected to study French. Okay. That makes French sense. is supposed to be an easier language because it's a fallen language. It's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's been corrupted. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, off they went to school. And every time, you know, every time Charlotte had this kind of idea in her head, Emily was always going, I don't want to do this. I want to stay home. You know, <laughs> I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to meet anybody. I don't want to try anything in you, you know. And, yeah. um, but Charlotte was very insistent. So off they went to school um, and Emily didn't last very long. She said, I'm going home now. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Charlotte kind of needed Emily, though, because mm -hmm. when uh, she was left there alone without, you know, somebody from home, she was very lonely. She was very depressed. Uh, she even went to meet with, uh, I mean, everybody there was Catholic at mm -hmm. that school and, uh, you know, where they were. And uh, she went to confession one time because she was so lonely, but she was a Protestant and she didn't believe in confession. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah. And a lot of these experiences uh, that Charlotte had, she put into her books. Okay, so the first one that she wrote, I believe, was The Professor. And that one, to be quite frank, wasn't very good. Okay. I, uh, see, I've not even heard of this one before. That's how little I know about the Brontes. I've heard of Jane Eyre, but not the Villette. Interesting. Yeah, so uh, The Professor was her attempt to write kind of a sweet story 
about a guy who, you know, goes and becomes a, a teacher and then he falls in love with somebody, maybe a student. I, I only read it once because it was just not, it, it, how shall I put it? Um, she was writing a character that she didn't understand. Uh, she's not a guy and she wasn't very masculine. She couldn't do it. Emily could pull it off, but, <laughs> but she couldn't. <laughs> so her guy seemed really wimpy, you know. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not the most believable kind of. Yeah. It's more like a fun sort of easy read, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it just didn't have enough conflict in it to be really exciting in any mm -hmm. way. I mean, he's a, a good guy and he gets a nice girl and um, this is just nonsense. This is not anybody I know. Um, so, uh, yeah, so she, I think she got rejected on that, on that book. Mm -hmm. Then I believe she wrote, she wrote Jane Eyre and that one is quite gothic. Oh, yes. I've seen the movie, but I'm sure it deviates from the book, so I can't even say for sure if they're similar at all. So, Yeah, well, um, she drew on some experiences that she had at that school when she was abroad, but she turned them into something bigger than life, okay? And I'm going to share something. She had a crush on one of her teachers. Mm hmm. That makes okay. sense. OK. And, that you know, that sounds so innocent. And, you know, nowadays that wouldn't be even a grounds for gossip. Right. But in, she felt so guilty about the whole thing that in her mind it became convoluted, you know. Um, so there was the school that they were at was run by husband and wife. Um, both of whom were competent teachers. The husband took an interest in Charlotte and Emily because he could tell they were writers. I mean, he could tell even without being told, without their having published anything, you know, because he would, they would study French with him. This was all in French and they mm -hmm. were writing essays and actually Emily's essays were the best. Um, but um, he also wanted to encourage Charlotte because Charlotte was pretty good too. Um, and after Emily left, it was just Charlotte. And so he spent some time helping her hone her craft in French. Now, she was a very lonely person who wanted to have a life and maybe she misinterpreted his kindness as, you know, more than what it was. Um, after she came home, she kept writing him letters, you know, um, that she missed him and all sorts of things like that. Oh. And of course, his wife was reading those letters. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. He wasn't interested in her, in her in that way. And he, he and his wife, you know, they were on the same page. Yeah, he was just a mentor. He wanted to help her with her writing. She misinterpreted it, being a young woman and being attracted or interested in this, unfortunately for her. Yeah, yeah so I think that I, I kind of see that when she wrote The Professor, she was trying to put herself in the teacher's shoes, but she couldn't really do that. She didn't have the skill and the psychological acuity to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Later, when she wrote Jane Eyre, she kind of transformed him, him into Mr. Rochester. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so remember, Mr. Rochester is married. Yeah. Uh, but he has a mad wife in the attic. <laughs> Okay. That's... Yeah, and he's trying to get Jane to marry him without telling her that he's already married. Yeah, that's the part that I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a different kind of. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do you remember what the happy ending was? 
doesn't he go blind? If, uh, yeah. And they, yeah, and they end up being together. But I, I'm not really sure. Did they ever get married, like legitimately, or the wife dies? If I remember right, the, Does wife, she the wife died. Okay. And by the way, if you heard something, somebody outside was shooting, and Bo was upset by that. There was a gunshot. You know, we have hunters. Yeah, people are hunting. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I didn't that. really hear. I just heard a dog barking. Actually, that was all I heard. No, yeah, that was Bo. He was upset. You know, he's not a live stream, but he was upset about the shot. So, yeah, no. What happened was, okay. So, Mister Rochester almost got um, Jane to marry him. Took her to the altar, and then some guy showed up and said, "Hey, I have a reason why these two cannot be married." <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, when she found out that he had lied to her and blah, 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 um, and she got very upset. She left. She went to some other place where she met a guy named St. John Rivers or I, I can't remember. But anyway, uh, she met a guy who wanted her to marry him and become a missionary. Uh, but she didn't really want to. You know, she was still in love with Mr. Rochester and yeah. she felt her health would not, she wouldn't survive it if she went to Africa or wherever to become a missionary. So, <laughs> so anyway, but all of a sudden, because this is a Gothic novel, she had a telepathic message that she got from Mr. Rochester that he needed help. <laughs> so, okay, so she runs back and she finds out that something really horrible happened. The mad wife in the attic uh, tried to burn the whole house down and, or did it by accident. I don't know what, anyway, he was, Mr. Rochester tried to save her. She died, but he was blinded and needed a lot of help. Yes. Okay, so now it's morally acceptable for Jane to marry Mr. Rochester. Number one, his wife is dead. And number two, he suffered a lot. Yes. So that makes it okay. Yeah. All right. I always thought that was kind of not okay. You know, yeah, right? I didn't really like, like, honestly, I didn't like the fact, oh, he's blind now. And now you're going to, it kind of was weird, but I was like, okay. <laughs> okay. So I think, though, that I understand psychologically why Charlotte did it that way. Charlotte wasn't brave. She wasn't morally brave. You know, Emily, I'm not saying that anything that Emily wrote in Wuthering Heights was based on anything in her life. It probably wasn't. But she wasn't afraid to write things that other people might not think were moral or, you know. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Like, and you went, there were things that she was okay putting on the page that, Charlotte wanted, yeah, yeah. And by the way, there's no sex in any of these novels. So no, no, no. But just like the morality, the whole idea, like it's. I'm not saying it's by yeah. modern standards. Right. Exactly. So anyway, Emily was a free spirit. She was such a free spirit that she didn't need other people. She didn't actually have any romances with anybody. She, she wrote from her imagination and from her heart. Uh, Charlotte was much more of this world and she needed to have something real in her life. Um, and also when she was writing, she was taking information that she had gathered in real life and transforming it, you know, into something that would make a good story and mm -hmm. also having some kind of catharsis for herself. Um, in the process. Okay, so there are parts of Jane Eyre that are very moving. The part about the boarding school and the sister who died, mm -hmm. that's very moving. I mean, she doesn't have it as Jane's sister, but it it was based on her sister. Um, so that's kind of a cameo by the eldest sister, and she appears in, in Jane Eyre. Um, and so she also uh, transformed her very strong feelings of love um, into the story of Mr. Rochester. But something about all that was, 
it, it, it kind of went sour. You know, it's not right. You don't feel good about it, really. Yeah, I just. Yeah. So anyway, what happened was Branwell died in 1848. Followed a few months later by Emily. And within a year, Anne also died, I believe. And that left Charlotte all alone with her father. And so it was very sad. And she tried to work through all of this by writing. So she wrote a novel called Shirley. Hmm. Um, and that was supposed to be, um, it was supposed to be her making her sister Emily into a heroine in a novel. But while Shirley was, you know, headstrong and determined and spunky and all that, she wasn't Emily. No, definitely not. Yeah, she was. Uh, it, it's just that Charlotte wasn't able to accept the parts of Emily that were weird, you know, or different or socially unacceptable. And so she turned the character Shirley into someone who's not that interesting, you know, and the story wasn't that interesting. I mean, the most interesting part about it is that she does address the industrial revolution and oh. how uh, the countryside that used to be so pretty was turning kind of ashen. <laughs> so. Interesting though. Like, well, it's an observation that's interesting, but it sounds like the quirky things about Emily were left aside to have a more standardized character, I suppose, that she could accept. Is that right? It yeah. Yeah. So, so that one wasn't a real success either. And then um, Villette is her last novel. Um, and Villette is actually pretty good. It's, it's not anything that you'd expect. It's not your, you know, if you're somebody who read Jane Eyre, and you're expecting another Jane Eyre, you're not going to get another Jane Eyre. Um, Villette is more nearly autobiographical than any of, of her other writings. But because she was so conflicted over the feelings that she had, she had to hide it so hard that even her, her character, um, Lucy Snow, um, her character was lying to the reader half the time about how she was feeling and what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, if, if any of my novels was in any way influenced by, um, by Charlotte, mm -hmm. um, I would say that it was influenced by Villette. And the novel that was the most influenced by it was Our Lady of Kaifeng, the first part. Mm -hmm. It was also influenced by Muriel Sparks, The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. Oh, but, I know. I like that. I've seen parts of that, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a very small, very short novel by Muriel Spark, but it has a lot of kick to it. It does. Uh, yes. Um, but anyway, to some small extent, I would say because it was my experience being abroad as a person who wasn't young enough to learn the language well, um, there were parts of it that, that were, are a little bit like Villette. Um, so in Villette, there's this mousy woman <laughs> uh, whose last name is Snow. and at first, you don't even know that she's going to be your protagonist. You you think, okay, she's our narrator, but mm -hmm. she's not going to be our protagonist. Um, and it starts out with a sweet, sweet thing uh, called Paulina showing up, kind of an orphan, you know, <laughs> sweet Polly. And, and it's a story about her and some guy named John or Graham. <laughs> or, you know, he's called both John and Graham. It's confusing. Everybody's got like two names at least. Um, and at first, you you don't realize this, but 
Lucy is in love with this John guy, but she's hiding. She's hiding everything about herself. And then she she's an orphan and all her family have died. And uh, she's in her godmother's house living there until she gets a job in a school in Brussels. Guess what? Oh. <laughs> yes. <Sounds> <laughs> <lot> like. <laughs> Yeah, and and then these people um, from Breton end up there too, and there are a bunch of other people. And okay, so our mousy heroine is dealing with the fact that nobody really likes her, and she doesn't really like anybody else that much, and she's all alone. Mm-hmm. And she goes through, you know, she's at the school during Christmas vacation or something like that. Anyway, some kind of vacation. Everybody else leaves. She's left there all alone. Oh, wow. And she suffers a bout of depression. And even though she hates Catholics, she goes to confession. <laughs> Just like Charlotte. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's, because... You have to have something a little bit weird going on in a gothic novel. There's this weird nun that shows up in the middle of the night and you don't, you know, (laughs) she goes, what's going on? But there is this kindly uh, professor, uh, teacher, and he even sees through all of uh, Lucy Snow's machinations he sees through her he knows she has a crush on that other guy he talks to her he respects her um and eventually she falls for him and the school mistress who runs the school is very catholic and she spies on everybody <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Charlotte has an anti-Catholic bias, so she she plays up that angle. Yes, Protestants will often do, and I'm like, oh, yes, we, I got it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So she, uh, the the there's some kind of family relationship between the guy that she likes and the the head of the school, who is spying on everybody. Um, <laughs> Anyway, in this story, the love is reciprocated eventually, and they think they're going to be together. He leaves for, you know, he leaves on a ship, I don't know, for America or wherever, Um, but they keep corresponding, and then she doesn't hear from him, and at the end, we know that something happened, and she's not going to be with him. But she's okay because she knows that he loved her. Hmm. And that's the, you know, that's the end of your story. Interesting. Okay. What, what are your thoughts about that? Um, it seems a little bit more subdued than Jane Eyre. Um, it's not a horrible story, um, but you don't have like this drawn out storyline that would really draw you in. It just seems kind of like a nice, calm story. It's not, there's nothing it, major it, it, going on. Okay, well, maybe I didn't tell you all the major stuff. The major stuff is that she goes through these depressions and she sees visions of another. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of big. That's, <laughs> that's not an out of the ordinary thing. But it just sounds like she ends up being alone, but she kind of wants to romanticize it. But she's okay because the gentleman loved her, which isn't a bad thing, but it's not yeah. Jane Eyre. It's not Jane Eyre. That's all I'm going <laughs> to. No, it's not Jane Eyre. Um, I think the reason why I would recommend reading it Mm -hmm. is that it's a little bit tricky to find out what's going on. And I kind of like that in a novel. Oh, good. I do. Your head. Yeah. Okay. I actually do like that because I feel like a lot of novels, I know what's going to happen right away. And people are like, oh, I didn't see that coming. But I'm like, I saw that coming. So I do like that. Yeah. It is a little bit tricky. It's hard to understand uh, your protagonist, and it's especially hard for young women who've never been through what Charlotte has been through. Mm-hmm. 
So I was watching <laughs> some very young readers talking about this and they said, well, it's really hard to, you know, get your head wrapped around her. What's, what is the deal? Why does she lie to us? Why does she lie to the reader? Why is she sh so hard to get to know, you know, and all of that? Life and experience. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think I understand. I think it's I easy. would. Yeah, life experience is like once you've figured out the world, you're not going to be an open book, even in a novel. I mean, to me, that makes sense. And I haven't read the story. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it, it, you know, and Madame Beck, the 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 owner of the uh, of the school and whatever. The reason she doesn't like her is because she put the wife of the man that she was in love with into the story, even though in this story they weren't married to each other. Yeah. So so naturally, her she feels antagonism toward that woman. That makes sense. Yeah, there's that. It's based on real life experiences. So I can see why, especially given the time period, people are not going to, even nowadays, people are not going to be an open book about everything that's happening in their life. So of course she's going to deceive the reader. It's a given. Like to me, that makes sense. Am I right. missing something? I don't know. It makes perfect sense to me. And I haven't read the story. Yeah. So, so all, to me, all of the feelings that that she has makes sense once you understand what's behind the story yeah, yeah. Well, maybe yeah people just need to investigate the storyline a little bit more and then they'll get that yeah well i don't know i mean some people think that you shouldn't look behind a story um and a lot of people do look behind every story and make up stuff that didn't happen i don't think anything even remotely resembling Wuthering Heights ever happened to Emily. So, you know, it, it's it's not that I have a penchant for doing that. But in the case of Charlotte, I think I know Charlotte really well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mrs. Gaskell wrote a, uh, a biography of her. Um, and I also, I used to, I, when I was practicing law in Grand Prairie, I used to go to the um, biographical or literary biographical uh, part of the library and I read there about the lives of all of my favorite authors including Ayn Rand by the way <laughs> um, but uh, yeah so in that library there was a book and by the way I later found out my grandfather had this book oh wow uh, but I didn't read it in my grandfather's library at the time. It's by Daphne du Maurier, and it is called The Infernal World of Branwell Bronte. Okay, that's interesting. I have read Rebecca by du um, Maurier, so hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, and it's it's she thinks that he ha he should have more credit for. Uh, the literary tradition of the Bronte sisters because he was involved in their juvenilia. Hmm. Um, so, and she also talks about um, how uh, Branwell went to visit or, or met with Hartley Coleridge. And um, so it's it's quite interesting some of the biographical information that he uh, that we have of him. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, but I don't know if I should. Um, you know what happens is that young people who are writing often reach out to better known people and ask for their uh, help yes. and support. And um, a lot of times they get discouraged. But I, I don't know if we should, we should talk about that anymore. But in any event, um, there's just a lot of biographical information available on the uh, Bronte sisters.
mm -hmm. um, and their brother. And uh, did you want to share the the photo of the sisters? Oh I yeah, let me go ahead and look for that special painting. Yeah, I'll find the painting. I just need to grab that up. Now, if anybody who's watching right now has a question or observation, uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, Julia, have you actually shared the stream anywhere while we were talking? I didn't get a chance to do that. I'm just going to, I will afterwards. Let me um, actually find the picture real fast because I should have had that to ready to go. Okay, I have it now. So I'm going to go ahead and go into screen share. Okay, I'm ready for you, but I don't see it yet. Okay. We should see it once I go here. Oh, okay. Do you see it now? Yes, I do. Just a moment. Okay, there they are. Wow, it's a very, I actually really like this portrait. I love the um, hairstyles of that time period. It's just very beautiful in a subdued sort of way. It's not super vibrant, but it looks like somebody was erased. Yes, that was Branwell. So Branwell was the one who painted the portrait and it was supposed to be a portrait of Charlotte, uh, Branwell, Emily, and Anne. If you start from the right-hand side of the screen, that's Charlotte. She was the eldest of, yeah, on the right, yes. And then Branwell was the second. He was supposed to be in the middle. And then after him, to the left of him, Emily, and to the left of her, Anne. It was by, you know, their birth uh, position. Um, and he got, you know, actually the family wanted to send him to art school because they thought he was a great painter. And so they sent him he was supposed to go for an entrance examination or something at the art school in London. And he, uh, he had a panic attack and he never went. Oh, that's so, too bad. Yeah. And it's really hard to explain, you know, why would he do that? I, I, I never understood, but I think he, somehow didn't believe in himself enough. Yeah. Actually, I can kind of understand right away. Just, from having drawn and painted and just don't claim to be a master. I'm just an amateur myself. Sometimes you get down on a painting, especially if it's a self portrait, maybe he felt that he could have conveyed his like image better. So he erased himself and focused on the sisters. Perhaps that's what it was about. You never know. Well, uh, yeah, I, I don't think so. If he, if he were just being self critical about his ability to paint, he might have thought he didn't do a very good job on the sisters either. But maybe because it was about himself. Some people, if they're painting themselves, maybe they feel like, or maybe they just want to focus on the sisters. Maybe it's that he didn't want to put himself in the painting. That could be it. Yes, that's what I think. It, I think he was disappointed in himself. And he maybe even felt that he didn't deserve to be in their company. You know? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. So, but I think he was a good painter, don't you? Oh, no, I think he's a wonderful painter. I really love this portrait. It's very nice. And I love this that he uses subdued colors. It doesn't have to be, like, bold and vibrant to convey that this is a nice family portrait. And I love family portraits, actually. I've always liked to see, like, families. And I can see, like, which one's older just by the hairstyles. You get an idea for the hairstyles of the time period, which is kind of nice. Yeah, and they're all wearing kind of a shawl over their dark dress. And that was common as well, like to wear a shawl. Yes, yes. Uh, and you can tell, I think, the character of each of the sisters um, by their faces. I see the older one, she seems more knowledgeable. Like you get that idea from looking at the painting to me. And she seems more subdued, if I could be wrong. But I, that's what it conveys to me. To me, it also seems that she's more determined and, uh, you know, looking more outside herself. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, whereas if you look at Emily, Emily is kind of in a trance, sort of. Um, I, yeah, I do see that with her eyes. Her eyes look like she might even see a nun get up. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Ghostly nun. Although that was Charlotte who wrote that, but I could see yeah, Emily. Charlotte wrote that. that. Yeah, but um, no, I, I'm not saying that she saw anything supernatural, but she just, uh, she was actually more of an inward glancing person. So she was. I would say Charlotte was more of an extrovert, Emily more of an introvert. And what happens with introverts is they look inside themselves a lot, which makes it seem to other people that they're not paying attention. But sometimes they notice things more than the people who are extroverted. Well, the thing about introverts is they actually know themselves very well. And the thing that I actually really respect about an introverted person is they know what they like. They're not always looking to the outside world to find validation. So they're just misunderstood. That's my take on it. Yes. Yes. And then what do you think about Anne? Now, with Anne, she looks like she's more um, exuberant, like she's more excited like she looks like she's looking around like looking to see what could be happening yeah yeah um Anne was more practical than emily but you know less poetic um and she wrote uh she wrote the tenant of white wildfell hall and in that story there's a woman who is um she has an abusive husband an alcoholic and she gets away from him and she makes a living by painting. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And was more willing to write about, you know, social issues like that. So if she had lived, we probably would have seen some great literature from her as well. I'm taking it. I mean, it sounds like to me, they all would have contributed something if they had lived longer. Well, yeah, she did contribute. She has, I believe, two novels to her name. Okay, good to know. See, like I said, I don't have a background on, I didn't know if they were published or not. So that's good to know. Yeah, um, they have been published. I'm I'm not as big a fan of, of Anne, um, but that's just a personal thing. Okay. But I still think all the ladies and their brother, it seems like there's something that they've contributed and you could probably find something in one of each of them, different personalities could be yeah. drawn to different siblings. Yeah. And you never know. I mean, if their two elder sisters had lived, you never know what they would have produced. But yeah, that's what I was saying. I think all three of them, it sounds like all three of them would have written. They just would. And it apparently Anne did publish. All, all six. All yeah. Six. All six. All, all six. But the three of them, the three older sisters did pass away. Correct. Two. And, Two sisters died. Oh, two. Okay. I mean, all of them are dead now. <laughs> well, yeah, for sure. Like now, but I was, it sounded like to me, anyway, I'm not going to say anymore because I don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> That's okay. No, two died in childhood. Okay. Maria, the elder sister, and Elizabeth, the second sister, died in childbirth, uh, not childbirth, but childhood um, uh, when when they were at that school. Mm -hmm. I mean, they died at home, but, and then four of the children grew to adulthood. Um, but I, I think um, Patrick, uh, Patrick Branwell, the, the brother um, died in 1848. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how old he was, but then Emily died that same year. And I believe she was 30 years old at the time of her death. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, Anne died. Um, Charlotte lived to be about, uh, well, she got eventually got married. She married to um, one of the curates that worked for her father and who eventually inherited the job of that church. Mm -hmm. And she, at the time of her death, she was pregnant, but none of them had any children. Well, that's unfortunate that she may have been a, but indicative of the time period, but that's unfortunate to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's another reason why I think, you know, the people who talk about zero population growth, 
um, may have it wrong. So for instance, the, the Bron Bronte family had six children, but they did not contribute to overpopulation of this world because not one of those six children left behind a child of his own. No, they did not. They did not. I don't really like any population growth theories. I feel a family should, if they want to have children, they can. If they don't, they don't need to. So I don't really, anyway, that's another topic. Right. Yeah. So anyway, um, do you have any questions uh, about um, any of their works or their Okay. History? So you're saying Villette would probably be a good book to read because it's based on our, the first installment of Our Lady of Kaifan. I was just wondering, was um, Father Horvath, Horvath, is he based on a character in any of that, in that book? I'm just curious. Well, he actually, that's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you in what way I was influenced and in what way it's similar. I was influenced uh, because Charlotte was writing about her one and only experience abroad. Um, mm -hmm. And she was talking about, I mean, you could tell how lonely it could be. You know, she wasn't fluent in French and yet she had to talk French all the time and everybody around her was speaking French. Um, and I found myself in Taiwan when, you know, during the period that that kind of inspired me to write Our Lady of Kaifeng. And even though I thought I was pretty good at languages, I wasn't actually able to pick up Chinese you know, Mandarin as well as I thought I was going to be. Um, and, and it's really about a period in your life when you're not as receptive anymore. Um, so in some ways that was similar. Father Horvath, is a, a composite figure based partially on a person that I did meet in Taiwan, but his behavior in some ways is very similar to the French professor um, that Charlotte liked. Um, oh, you know, wow. there's this kind of, uh, I don't know how to explain this exactly, but this kind of negativity. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but he has a weird sense of humor that I really like. I liked Father Horvath. He was one of my favorite characters, actually. Yeah, uh, he's one of my favorites, too. Um, and yeah, so there is a similarity. I wouldn't say I wasn't completely influenced by that, but I was also uh, playing off of somebody that I'd actually met. Like a real person. That's kind of... He's a very interesting character. So I was just curious about him. That's all, like where he comes yeah, from. Yeah, no, no, that's a good question because I think there is a grain of truth to what you just said. It's just not that simple. You know, it's- a Oh no, he's very, he's very complex. I'm just, I've never read of any, I've never encountered a character like him, but just like taking Mariah to, you know, just disappearing on her like that. It's just very odd. It's just like the way he disappears. <laughs> I'm just like, who does that? <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. That some of that stuff um, is is based on reality, and some of it is not. But anyway, yeah, that's yeah, a good question. Um, so, have we shared this elsewhere? Uh, I wonder. I can do that right now if you like. Um, I was gonna wait until the end because we were just talking. And I was, but let me share it. I'll do that. Was there anything else that you wanted to add about the Brontes that you haven't discussed yet? Well, I, I really love their juvenilia, um, which they wrote tiny little books. You know, in those days, the paper was very expensive. Mm -hmm. So they wrote, I'm, I'm sure Kate would be interested in their handwriting because they had to write so small on these tiny slips of paper. They created their own little books when they were children. And um, so I, I really enjoy some of their stories, um, some of the poems that Emily came up with as a result of those stories. So a lot of Emily's poems you might think 
like for instance, The Prisoner. I don't know if you've ever read Emily's poem, The Prisoner. I haven't actually. Um, well, you, you might think, oh, this is so, um, this is so metaphysical. She's a prisoner in her body and blah, blah, blah. But actually they wrote about people in dungeons, you know, in their, <laughs> yeah, in their stories, because it was a little bit gothic. So, um, uh, so some of Emily's poetry actually refers to the Gondol um, series. Hmm. So I did share this somewhere. So I'm hoping maybe a few people can turn tune in. And another question: um, Are there any poems that foreshadowed the novels that they wrote? Like any other poems? Well, if you read The Prisoner, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. And you also read Withering Heights. You do see that there is the same kind of defiance of death, of um, of being told by other people what to do. I, I would like to think that Emily was a libertarian. Yeah. I think many writers and many artists actually are libertarian. There's quite a few. There's actually many examples. And many free thinkers are actually libertarians, honestly. Yeah. They just are, you know? Yeah. I think so. I I certainly hope they don't cancel Emily. Oh gosh. Like, you know what? All I can say is if you cancel something, you're not open to any culture of any kind. That's my take on it. You know, because you don't want to know anything about the world if you keep canceling stuff. It makes no sense. Right. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, a lot of people that I thought were libertarian are now in favor of canceling things like Dr. Seuss. And okay, that's that's absurd. Dr. Seuss, it's just, if you don't like something, you don't have to watch it or you don't have to have it on a certain channel, but you don't get to say everybody else can't read something or watch something. You just don't have that privilege. I feel like you're trying... It just sounds a little too um, like the PRC or something. Like you're trying to dictate what people should do. Like you want some sort of state run television or media that is bonkers because you'll change your mind every five minutes. Like next week, what are they going to cancel? It's ridiculous. Somebody said they might cancel Sa Saturday Night Live or I'm just like, but now that's okay. You see what I'm saying? Where is this going? It's going nowhere. It's going downhill really fast. Well, you know, to take a devil's advocate position. So I was uh, talking to one of my friends, one of my libertarian friends, and she said, mm -hmm. well, you know, a publishing company has the right to cancel anybody they want. And I don't like it when you call it cancel culture. Well, sure, they can, they have the right, you know, not to publish someone. But yeah, they have every right not to publish someone. I'm not talking about that. If it's your own private publishing company or your own television if you want to make a statement saying that this movie no longer reflects our morals that's fine you have you can do that if you want yeah yeah but the thing is i think we're also allowed to laugh at them when they do that don't you think oh i'm laughing a lot especially since like now like greece like um dr zeus things that are pretty innocuous like that have just always been part of our culture, our society shows like this, books like this, they're not even intellectual. Um, so I don't understand, like, what's the point? Who are you hurting by canceling Dr. Zeus? I don't know. You're hurting yourself because what kind of sanitized, boring, vapid literature and movies do you want us to watch if you keep canceling things? Like, what are we allowed to watch? What are we allowed to read? Nothing? Are we just allowed to read gibberish? I mean, I don't know. It's pretty bizarre to me. <laughs> yeah well I mean it used to be that everybody understood that book burning was something wrong yeah. yeah it's wrong and guess what liberals used to say oh we're against book burning and they used to say oh conservatives want to do that but they're doing the same old thing they're doing the exact same thing and they can't deny it anymore you can't say that you're against book burning if you're pro cancel culture you just can't it's a lie if you do yeah. You're doing the same thing. That's just my take on it. <laughs> no, I agree. I, I absolutely agree. And the thing is the 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 Bronte sisters, they um 
there are a lot of sequels that people have written since then um, to their stories. I, I think there was a book that was written from the point of view of the mad wife. Mm -hmm. That would <laughs> be interesting. Adding, yeah. Um, I think it's called The Wide Saragossa Sea, uh, but I didn't read it, so I, I'm, I'm not actually. But there, once you have a body of literature like that, lots of other books refer to it. Then if you cancel it, what happens to all those books? You know, well, they, I guess by association, they have to be canceled because, you know, they are somehow tainted. But let's just forget cancel culture for a minute. A channel, a station, a publishing company, they have every right not to put out a movie or publish a book, but they don't have the right to tell the general public that they can't read certain things. That's all. Yeah. I Nobody agree. said I made you the dictator of the world. So I don't really care about cancel culture. It can cancel itself out. That's what I said. <laughs> yeah. And we're allowed to call it that, you know, it, uh, just because they have a right to cancel things doesn't mean that we can't call it canceling, you know? Yeah, exactly. So it's just ridiculous. Like, I think eventually it will cancel itself out because I think people are going to become so enraged. People are going to get irritated eventually because they're one day they might not have canceled the book you like or a show that you like but they will cancel something that many people like and then finally maybe people will begin to realize oh we don't want certain groups of people becoming the dictators of what we consume read it makes no sense like if you're for free press allowing a company a publishing company movie makers to make what they want to make stop engaging in this cancel culture that's all right and at this point, I would like to plug some of the Inverted A authors because, um, after all, we are a publishing company. Yeah, you should. Yes, we want to hear about your books. Well, okay. This is uh, one of our very well-known authors, John Wheatcroft, and he has a book that we published that is called The Portrait of a Lover. And... This book by him, also by John Wheatcroft, it was not published by Inverted A, uh, but he gave me a complimentary copy, and it's called Catherine, Her Book, and it's actually a prequel to Wuthering Heights. Oh, interesting. See, very nice. It's about the romance between Catherine and Heathcliff when they were children. And here is the author when he was younger. So, you know, at Inverted A Press, we, we like the old style of fiction. We also like the old style of poetry. We like poetry that scans. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, let me see if I can find here. This poor book is falling apart. I've lost one of the pages already. Aww. Yeah. See, <laughs> this is what happens when you keep old books. And by the way, it shows that my grandfather was not a snob. He didn't have to have a first edition of everything. And he felt perfectly okay with buying, you know, um, pocket books. Yeah, that's fine. I've heard some people say, oh, I can't buy that. But it's fine to have any copy of a book that you want, in my right. opinion. So let me see here if I can find some poetry. It might not be by Emily. It might be by Branwell. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start reading, and we'll see where that takes us. And if we have any comments from anybody, uh, you can let me know, Julia, okay? Yeah, for sure. Definitely. I'll look to see. I don't... Um, okay, so I'm, I'm reading on page 126 of Daphne du Maurier's The Infernal World of Branwell Bronte. Okay, and here it starts. He would never have the courage to attend mass in the assembly room 
which the Irish work people rented on Sundays and holy days. The Pope was still antichrist to one brought up in an evangelical tradition in Catholicism itself, the, the Scarlet Woman. Um, here perhaps lay the deep attraction to those revivalists who shouted their hallelujahs in the hills around Haworth and whom he so much despised. Yes, and to his Freemason brethren also, Rome was anathema. Temptation lay in those bleeding crucifixes, those cheap, too brightly colored statuettes of mother and child. The heady smell of incense, the veiled and sinister glance of the black-robed visiting priest. The squalid cabins of the Liverpool Irish had a glow to them, a glorious, dirty warmth pervading Branwell's senses, clouding his intellect. Whiskey, lust, and probably laudanum, too, creating an image even more benign and merciful than that of his dead sister Maria, or of the other Mary, Percy's second wife. Years earlier, in his account of that Mary's death, Branwell put into the mouth of her grief-stricken husband the words, Hadst thou never been alive, I should not now be alive. An echo of that cry is to be found in one of his poems dating from the London Foot days. So I'm going to now read that poem, apparently by Branwell. Amid the world's wide din around, I hear from far a solemn sound that says, remember me. And though thy lot be widely cast, from that thou picturedest in the past, still deem me dear to thee, since to thy soul my light was given to give thy earth some glow of heaven. And if my beams from thee are driven, dark, dark thy night will be. What was that sound? Twas not a voice from ruby lips and sapphire eyes, nor echoed back from sensual joys, nor a forsaken fair one sighs. I, when I heard it, sat amid the bustle of a town-like room, neath skies with smoke-stained vapors hid, by windows made to show their gloom. The desk that held my ledger book, beneath the thundering rattle shook of engines passing by. The bustle of the approaching train was all I hoped to rouse the brain or startle apathy. And yet, as on the billow swell, a highland exile's last farewell is born o'er Scotland's sea, and solemn as the funeral knell, I heard that soft voice known so well cry, Oh, remember me. So that was Branwell. Yeah, it's pretty deep. Wow. Yeah, it, it's a little bit on the purple side, but. Uh, that was what poetry was like in those days. Well, it's much more decipherable. I I prefer hearing people read poetry from the 18th century, 19th century, as opposed to today. Some poetry is just rambling, and it's like I don't really. It doesn't read like a poem. Like some things today that are considered poetry, not to hate on it, it's just not enjoyable to hear read. To be honest. Yeah, so so Dr. Seuss, who has recently been canceled, is one of the only poets, well-known poets of um, the 20th century, I think, that actually used meter and rhyme. Of course, it was for children and it wasn't taken seriously, but it still had those qualities. Yes, it did. And I maybe some people are jealous of his ability to do that. That could be it. I mean, I, I I sort of think when they cancel something, they see people are drawn to a story, to a movie. And there's something about that piece of art that makes people feel like maybe a little bit of jealousy. And that's kind of what I interpret cancel culture as being, is they don't want somebody to, they might have felt like um, hatred towards it. But if they really did, they wouldn't be looking at it or thinking about it. Why would you be engaging with a piece of literature or movie that just offends you so much? It makes no sense, really. Yeah, 
it's giving the the piece of literature uh, a power that you would think you wouldn't want to give it. So I heard some people saying that now certain copies of Dr. Seuss's works are going to be bootlegged. You know, they're going to be sold under the table. That shouldn't even be happening. Because look, if this company no longer wants to publish his books, I suppose, that's fine. They don't have to. But there should be a publishing company that can. I mean, well, the question is whether it's still in copyright or not. If it's not in copyright, we can all publish it. And I'd be happy. Well, yeah, exactly. If it's not, in, and actually, that's one of the good things about like the books that are out of copyright. I mean, if you want to make your own copy of it, you can definitely do that. Yeah. Well, at this point, Bo is letting me know that my time is up. But thank you so much for um, for participating in this live uh, stream. Yeah, thank you for sharing about the Brontes. I learned quite a bit, and it sounds like people should check out their novels. Yes, definitely. And we'll talk again. Sure. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.